welcome to this uh, BobConf talk. Thanks to the organizers for having me. And it's a pity to have to do this pre-recorded, but I hope it will be as good as the live experience, or at least close. So before I start, I want to manage expectations a little bit. The following talk is anecdotal in nature. So the thing I'm going to be presenting now is, is not just an idea that I had and haven't tried in practice or anything like this, um, but it's also not a full fleshed out philosophy that you may be able to directly apply to um, whatever you're working on. Um, it, it is a real experience I've had working on a real production system, and I think it's worth sharing. Also, there isn't really probably not much new ideas there in the sense that there are existing complete fleshed out philosophies of how to design systems out there that this is probably just one aspect of and one variation, and I don't claim novelty. But still, I hope you can take something out of this. So here's the setting. Imagine maybe you're, built, you're part of a startup. Some visionary founder has a really great and innovative idea for something that the world hasn't seen before. Or maybe you're just reinventing the wheel again, but you have good, pull, uh, good public relations, uh, so the whole thing flies. And um, so, so you as the founder of the startup, maybe you probably have many ideas about how to build a thing. You have some idea for a secret sauce that makes this better than anything else. And you gather a bunch of 10x programmers around you, everyone an expert in whatever field you need to, to build the thing you want to build. And they're all very excited to build the thing you want to build and, 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 and contribute to this machinery that makes this great. And they all go out and, and, and go off and build this thing. And the whole thing grows and grows as you add features and as you add new ideas. And at some point, you think you're done and whatever you have grown and built, that's what you ship. Great, well done. But what could happen is that as you build the thing, it, it, it kind of grows. And when you're done, whatever shape that thing has, that becomes the interface, the exterior view onto the system or platform or service that you build which means it's defined by how it was built. Maybe the names and types and shape like, and, and, and the functions of the interface uh, kind of reflect the interior workings of the system. And maybe that means that your users will have to understand how the system works in order to use it. But maybe they don't want to. Presumably, they just want to know what your system is what it does and how they can use it without needing to know the interior of your machinery. Also, when you build it like this, then maybe the whole behavior of the system, so not just how you interact with it, but also what happens then, is purely defined by how you build it. Now that's implementation defined. And, and that may be good, but it also means it may be hard to you know, evolve your system and change it because you don't know what behaviors maybe the users now rely on, which behaviors of system are just now part of the, the contract with your users, so to say. So all in all, clearly not so very satisfying. And at my previous job, I, I think we were at risk of doing precisely that. So what we were building is what I would describe as a decentralized serverless service hosting platform. So from the user's point of view, or the developer's point of view, you can create services, you build them in a language that compiles to WebAssembly, which is this nice container or nice abstract format for um, compiled code that can run in a sandbox very nicely. You upload it to the platform, and then you can interact with the outside world and also with other services on the platform uh, using asynchronous messaging. So there were quite a few things we, we were building that didn't exist in this particular format before. And at, at some point, I vaguely remember that the team building the system component that passes messages between these services and, and between the shards and whatever that means, uh, they were claiming we, manage, we can now support messages between services. And we didn't even have an inkling of how these services would send messages or receive messages or how the outside would send messages to and from the system. So. I, my impression was that we were at risk of treating the public interface of the whole system as an afterthought to implementation. And we were building it without 
knowing whether it makes sense end to end, whether it's usable, whether it's understandable for our developers. And in a, in a very abstract sense, we were building it without knowing what it is. Furthermore, we, we had other people in, that were supposed to build on top of the platform that we're building. They were building tooling, um, development kits that compile to this kind of service uh, um, module. We even built a new programming language, that, that's how I ended up in that place. And of course, these developers, they need to know the interface of the system and how it behaves. But if we're just building it from the inside out and, and then define the interface by accident, more or less, and then build on top of it, then we have a very long um, critical path. So we could not start building on top of features before they were completely implemented. Um, and that, that could be improved. So at, at that point, I started making a lot of fuss and annoyed the relevant people enough um, to let me go ahead with this idea that I proposed of uh, nailing down the public specification. And, and the idea that I behind this is that we should think of the system from the outside. So for a moment, let's try to completely forget all the clever implementation tricks and focus on the what, not the how of the system. So what do your users need to know about the system? Okay, so surely the, the concrete interface. So for a network servers, that might be the wire protocol, like the bytes on which order and what they mean, everything. For web servers, might be the REST endpoints and arguments and results. For library, it would be the function names and function signatures. But the interface isn't enough. The users also need to know what it means to call a certain function, to invoke a certain entry point, how they interact with each other, what, how time plays into play here. So more fancily, what the semantics of the system is. So how do we describe the semantics? Isn't this already the how question? Like how does the whole thing behave? The best question maybe best answered by implementation? Well, as I said, that you can do that. That's possible. But then you have an implementation defined system. And maybe sometimes that's fine. But um, sometimes I think we can do better. And the idea is that you only describe what's really relevant to the user to use your system. And ignore as much as possible of the stuff that the user doesn't care about. Um, there are different forms that specification can take. So it could be just a bunch of text, a bunch of prose describing how the system behaves. And that, that's a good start, of course. Or you could try to be more formal and describe the behavior of your system with mathematical precision, or at least some approximation thereof. Some pragmatism is probably always needed. So you, you could do by starting to describe the, the state of the system with mathematical notation. Sets, maps, relations, lists, all of it. But describe the abstract state. So not necessarily how your file system internally stores the data that the user gives you, but rather what is the mental model of that? And in the end, you get a document that is, in principle, everything a user or a developer needs to interact with your system. Everything they need to know should be in there, from the very concrete details of the interface, how, how to encode the messages, what is the parameter list of a certain function, and so on. But also what it means to use them, how do they interact, what are the preconditions, what are the failure conditions, and so on. And conversely, anything that is not in the document, or and, sorry, anything that the user does not need to care about should not be in the document. All the things you do in the behind the, the scenes, um, things you do about crash recovery, decentralization, performance, scaling, security, access control maybe and for administrative purposes, logging, whatever. Or all the things that make your product great because it works so good but doesn't really affect the, the raw essence of what it means to be your product, they should be out of this document. So this was the, the idea that I set out to, to establish and I, after enough nagging, I got some encouragement and I set out and I wrote this um, that specification document for our system. 
it was actually initially called the public spec because not the doc not because the document was public because at that time it wasn't public uh, but because it describes just the public the external view onto the system uh, it has been published since it's now called the uh, interface spec because the public spec was too confusing um, but i find that name still a little bit misleading because it's not just the, the interface if you think of interface as list of functions and, and methods uh, because it also contains the semantics and in this document i actually describe the semantics twice so there's a prose oriented section that describes in s but well, still very technical but accessible way or the entry points or the methods and then with prose des describes what these things do so it, it looks like like a reference document uh, manual maybe and then there's also a, a, a se separate section which is uh, more rigorous and more mathematical so there i start describing the state of the system as an abstract mathematical object so it has a bunch of fields and each field is a map or a set or a list and of course this is not the state that you would see in in production because production that's distributed there's a lot of other stuff going on but really this is what we think all that the a user ideally should need to know and think about when interacting with the system and i think already this section makes the work on a document like this worthwhile because you're really nailing down a abstract more conceptual model of your system that separates the what from the how of the implementation details. And once you've described the state of the system in that way, you can for every uh, state transition, sorry, for every function call, for every entry point, for everything that interacts with the system, either from, from the outside or maybe from inside from one of these services, you can now say how the state gets transformed. And that could either be a, a function that takes the old state and returns a new state, like if you want to do it more functional programming, or it could be um, a, a predicate that describes if the state before had these properties, after it has that, these properties, which is actually quite versatile because it means you can easily describe non-determinism or underspecification. Because you want the specification to describe the behavior with enough detail to make sense for the user, but probably you don't want to over constrain it in the sense that the, the implementation might have to make certain choices about scheduling of different events uh, because of distribution things might happen there might be resource limits there might be failure and and all of these things allow the syst uh, one implementation of the specification to maybe vary a little bit within clearly defined bounds in how they behave and a modeling using a mathematical idea of the state but then a relational description uh, of of the state changes actually works quite well. So the, the document cre uh, grew quite a lot. That was um, is now almost a book. It actually is a book because when I when I left, a colleague actually printed it um, as a book, which I found very very nice. Uh, thanks, Hans. Um, and it's certainly not the most accessible document, but it. It doesn't have to be. So it's not meant to be a tutorial for somebody working with this ecosystem for the first time to fully understand everything. Because it's it's also not a place for, um, or I think it's not a place for long justification, long design decision, history, a place where you would document alternative thing ways of how you could do things and describe why they were done like this. So I tried to keep it very concise and precise and um, a reference menu for people who mostly know it already but they need to have it written down some um, and even with that the restriction it still grows because these systems just become very complex over time even when they claim to be very simple i wrote this document in a um, text-based markup language um, uh, we used ascii doc because we used it elsewhere and and the point is for that is you can actually treat it like code. You put it in a Git repository, and then you make changes, you make pull requests, and you can review them. And this allows you to um, 
to have a engineer compatible model of communicating around this thing. Uh, and, and actually, as I said earlier, we have people building the thing from the inside and we have people building on top of the whole thing and we have the interface in between. And by introducing this document and also the repository around it and a workflow where new features will be fleshed out by describing their changes to the interface separately from thinking about how to actually implement them, we created a forum where the people can come together that use the interface from both sides, the, the people building it and the people using it. And they could now argue and discuss and debate and refine and improve on, on more or less equal footing. And I think this also helps a lot um, to, to build a nice interface and build a system that has a nice exterior view, because otherwise you might fall prey to convey the laws, which says that your software always looks a bit like your organizational structure. Uh, and, and, and more concretely, I, I observed, I mean, it's not, not very surprising. There's always a tendency to, to push complexity into other layers of your system. Um, so if the people building the system, the implementation, get to define the interface, they're more likely to push complexity across the border to the other team. And maybe build interfaces very low level, that may be very much tailored around how they actually build things internally. And, and it may end up being hard to use or uh, tricky to use, or um, it may be it may not um, be abstract enough to stay the same interface as the interface changes and evolves. So by looking at the interface on its own and discussing changes there, you have a better chance of thinking, couldn't we phrase it like this? And then we, if you ever do this particular feature, then we don't have to change the interface. As you could imagine, uh, it, it took a little while to anchor this document and the process around it in the organization. Um, and it, it's, I think it stays a continuous struggle to keep everyone on board because, of course, this kind of slows things down. If you just get, like, you know, somebody from high up tells you, now do this, we need to get this done in two weeks, and now you have to sit and write a document and discuss with people who get to use the feature first how this actually should look like and then get to implement it. Yes, it slows things down a little bit. Um, and, and there's always the risk that this kind of will fall on the wayside and people will just like, fall back to just building new features and maybe later update the specification document with um, what they have actually built. And then it just becomes documentation. And th this risk exists. And in order to, to counterpoint it a little bit, um, I at some point later, um, suggested that we maybe should invest into a reference implementation to make it more concrete. So what does this mean? So the idea behind the reference implementation is you, you take the specification document um, and then you build the most simple, most elegant, and most direct implementation that actually fulfills the specification without looking at the concrete production implementation. So you basically like clean room re-implementation and, and you make it as simple as possible. So you ignore everything you can ignore while still sticking to the specification. You ignore performance, reliability, scalability, persistence, crash recovery, distribution, security, all of the things that make your production system great, you can just ignore. But you still want to fulfill the whole specification, not just build a model of it, but really fulfill it, including the concrete interfaces, so that suddenly now you have two implementations of your system or of the idea of your system of your specification and both are kind of real enough to be used by the tools and libraries and programs that build on top of your platform so everything so that the people building these tools can now test against both production and reference implementation and everything that something doesn't quite work you you can now compare behaviors and this will hopefully turn on all the spots where the production system is not behaving as the specification. So every time there's a difference in behavior, um, you, it's either a bug in one of the two um, implementations and you can track it down, or maybe it's just a bad formulation in the spec and then you can fix that. So this really helps to keep the production implementation honest and close to the spec. 
And when writing this rough implementation, my suggestion is to really resist the urge to share code with the production implementation. Because once you share code, any kind of bug or misbehavior that is in the shared code will not show up. And, and a good way to do that is, of course, to use a very different programming languages. So uh, we used Rust in the production implementation. And then when I set out to, um, to build the Haskell, uh, the Rust implementation, I used Haskell. We had the spec maybe for half a year and things were going okay, but not great with like sticking to the spec. Um, so I just, yeah, did this thing. I sat down and re-implemented the whole spec in Haskell. And Haskell is great because it's really, I mean, you've heard this probably a few times before, it's really great for rapid prototype. I could alone in a few days implement the spec as it was at that time, and it was actually working compatible with the systems that were building on top of, um, of our system. There are plenty of libraries to use, so all the this plumbing I needed to do for the for the interfaces, like HTTP, Cbor, crypto, WebAssembly stuff, um, I could just use libraries for, so this was great. And then because it's a very high level language, I was able to mostly separate the, the plumbing code, so the code that deals with file formats and, and, and networking and these things, from code that ideally in a very high level way reflects the specification and not and just the specification. Well, ideally it should just read like the specification document, or at least the mathematical part of it. And um, well, now that we had the teams that were building on top of the platform, now they could use uh, two separate implementation in the test suite and, and this helped uh, to find bugs. It also just gave them more confidence in complaining when the implementation didn't match the spec because they could say, well, with your test, it passes here, it doesn't pass with your code, please fix it. And, and previously it was more like, well, look at this document there that somebody wrote, but maybe it's not up to date and so on and so on. Okay, and now that we started writing code around the spec, we can actually go one step further and write a, what could be called a specification acceptance test suite. Again, this is code written with just specification in mind, but now it sits on the other side of the interface. And it uses the system according to the interface and probes it in all the various ways to see if it actually behaves like the interface describes. And again, we have benefits of using an expressive language like Haskell um, with maybe good testing libraries. So we can do extensive fuzzing, we can do property-based testing, we can do uh, just very quickly describe many different test cases because it's a rapid programming language. And because the test suite is based on the specification and not the actual implementation, it is compatible with both implementations we have, the, the production implementation and the reference implementation. So we can use the test suite to test the reference implementation, which is already useful because it doesn't make, it's not much fun to write code without being able to test it easily and in isolation. Um, and then the test suite can also be used to test the production implementation and maybe should be part of the CI system for the production so that you continuously check that you're still satisfying the spec and at least those ways that you could map and express in the test suite. And then in the end, you have these two specification derived artifacts, the, um, the reference implementation, the reference test suite, they can test each other and they can test the production implementation and the production tooling on top of the system. So like a crosswise. And, and this gives a very nice confidence in that really everything you build is nicely built around the spec. So in my case, the test suite ended up being quite substantial, more than uh, 400 individual tests. And indeed it was very great to use Haskell there because just one or two lines of tests could easily express something that in the previous tests we were writing maybe with Rust were 10 lines or 15. And one thing I'm particularly proud of is that I introduced what, what I call the universal service. So one problem with testing a system like this is that for many kind of 
test steps you want to interact from the outset with the system. And then in the system, there is some kind of service running and it needs to send another message to another service and, and then comes back and then responds and some complex interaction involving both the outside and services on the platform. And if you just do it pedestrian wise, you have to program these services individually using languages you have available. And actually very early, we were partly writing them by hand in raw WebAssembly. This is like almost writing machine, well, not quite machine code, but it's very tedious. So it doesn't really, it doesn't scale. It's a lot of work for a simple test that maybe just sends a message back and forth. So what I did instead is I wrote a very a simple canister that implements a very simple programming language that it tells like that, that can instruct the canister or sorry the service to perform certain steps in sequence. And it takes the steps to perform from the message it receives from the outside. So I can write a test that uh, sits on the outside and then sends a message into one of these services. And the message contains some bytes that tell the service what to do. Send another service, which again, send another message, which again tells that service what to do, um, or maybe respond and, and all the other things a service could do on our platform. And then I embed this in, in my Haskell test suite by a simple DSL that allows me to describe in Haskell both the behavior of the test runner outside and completely transparently in one line and, and no separation um, what happens on the service. And then under the hood, it takes these, this DSL, creates a very simple script language out of it, passes it in a message to the service, and the service executes it. it it's actually simpler than it sounds. But it was very productive because now complex interactions are just one, two, three lines of Haskell that I don't know how we could effectively do uh, otherwise. So this is roughly as far as I were able to push this development model in practice. Uh, if you want to go further, uh, th there are some ideas of things that I would want to do but didn't manage to do. So at, at some point I was hoping that the reference implementation, you know, the nice, carefully polished abstract Haskell code that I wrote could be the specification. That I could take parts of that code, the relevant code in the non-plumbing modules, and include it in the specification document, just the way I include this kind of ad hoc pseudo math right now. And I think if with a little bit more effort, and, and care, this might be possible. It might be more likely possible in a language that has, gives you more control over syntax because you want this not to look like Haskell because not everybody likes reading code that looks like Haskell. You want to it to look like pseudocode that any reader is supposed to at least make some sense of. And languages like ACTA with the mix fix, mix fix syntax or maybe Isabel with this very flexible way of, of pretty printing the code in LaTeX and allowing you to replace certain definitions with actual LaTeX macros might actually be a way of getting a very nice output there. For Haskell, I think, I think the main reason why I gave up was that record syntax is just ugly, especially a nested record update in Haskell is not a simple one line thing. So you either need lenses and then you have these operators that are not obvious for non lens developers um, or yeah, or you have these manually written nested record updates and then it's it's not pretty. And then clearly a more ambitious goal would be to take the artifacts that we described above. So the, the specification with its mathematical or pseudomath content, the reference implementation, the reference test suite, maybe even the production implementation, and then connect them all using formal methods. And in the end have a formally verified implementation of the whole system. Now, this kind of extreme goal, that, that's something you can do if you're, if it's like a big research project or a very big commercial thing, like things like SEL4 and Compsa, they, they, they have done that, but it's still out of reach if you just want to build a thing and, and ship it. But it's a spectrum. You could start maybe taking the, the, the math in the document by hand translating it into a theorem prover. So you have a formalized model of your system and then prove certain core properties about your system, maybe some safety properties that 
this canister cannot change the code of uh, or the, the memory of the uh, sorry canisters are our services this service cannot change the code of that service over there or, or stuff like that at some point i even managed to take the haskell code from my reference implementation and convert it into cock code so that i could load it in cock and could start proving things formally about it so this would be one way of obtaining um, a formal model without having to write it again just take the reference implementation code and convert it into a system where you can do formal reasoning but then i didn't really get to do much with it and the code has grown a lot since then because the system grows um, so yeah the practicalities of getting something shipped seem to be hard to uh, get again in the way of doing these kind of formal proofs and there's a pity because if i if i could have ticked off that book sorry if i could have ticked off that box then what I've just described would almost completely fulfill the requirements for a deep specification as termed by the DeepSpec project. The so DeepSpec project is a, was, I have to check, um, a large research project in the US with um, a few Ivy League uh, universities uh, thinking about how we can make these kind of software specifications better and how to integrate formal method, methods. And, and they have, um, four requirements they have for a specification to be what they call max or to be maximally useful in, in, in their opinion so it needs to be rich so rich means um, it, it's not just the interface but it also describes the complex behaviors of the system and and maybe we have that our specification document describes how the um, how the system interacts upon certain messages and interactions the specification would be two-sided meaning connecting both implementation and clients. And, and in a way, I could argue we, we have that because we have not just the reference implementation built in the deck, but also the test suite that deals with the spec from the outside. It has to be formal, written with proper mathematical notation. Um, and we're halfway there, so we have this mathematical notation, but it's kind of ad hoc. It's, it's just on, on, on paper. It's not not something that a tool can consume to make things with it, like formal reasoning or generating code from it or stuff like that. So here we are falling a bit short. And then the, the fourth requirement is it needs to be live. And live means executable. And we have that in a way because we have the specification, not just on dead paper, but also as an executable reference implementation. But they also require live to be connected by formal proofs to the implementation. And of course, this is a big gap that we have where um, we have these testing mechanisms and reference tests and everything, but still whether the implementation actually matches the spec and therefore fulfills the properties that we could prove about the specification is not connected because it's still missing this formal proof stuff. All right, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, little of what I said here is really new. So if you want to maybe read something more structured about a methodology based on something like this, um, then, then certain terms uh, you can look for are consumer-driven contract testing, specification by example, domain-driven design, and um, that's actually a nice talk about um, Nicole Rauch's idea of functional essence, which also is quite similar to what I described here. So what can you take home from this talk? I think the most important takeaway is that as you design and build a system or a service or something like this, try to picture it from the outside. Create a, a mental model that is independent of, of the interior of the system, of the meditation, and is more abstract. And then build your system from the inside out to fill this abstract vision rather than the other way around of building first and then looking at what you have. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to a lively and uh, live Q&A session.